So we're live. Please go ahead. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Veins Park Community Forum. Uh, this forum is organized by the Veins Park Association. And we have Tony Edwards here from the Veins Park Association. Tony, is there anything you would like to um, say at this stage? No, I have Chris Edge, our chairman, sends his apologies. And so as his deputy, I'm standing in. And as we've said, um, thank you, Stephen, for also chairing it, because this will be your last formal forum. And we said you'll have to come along a civilian at the next forum. But um, thank you for your efforts in chairing it as well. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, I do look forward to coming along to the next community forum in Rings Park Library. Um, Chris says his sent apologies. Also have apologies from Councillor Anthony Fairclough. He unfortunately has been struck down by COVID and isn't able to attend this evening, which is obviously a great shame, but we hope he is uh, recovered soon. On tonight's agenda, we have Stephen Hammond. Oh, sorry, Stephen. Um, apologies also from Councillor Omar Bush for lateness, uh, and David Dean's got COVID. Okay, so another COVID vi victim. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, <clears throat> uh, on this evening's agenda, we have um, Stephen Hammond coming to speak to us. I've received uh, advice that he has votes to defend in Parliament. So we're not entirely sure he has these six votes to attend, whether he will be able to join us this evening or not. I hope he's able to join us and obviously I'll slip him into the agenda um, as soon as he is available to, to join us, if indeed he is. Um, so apologies for lateness from Stephen Hammond. Are there any other apologies? No, I don't think there are. So, the first item on the agenda is the open forum. Now, I have received prior notification from two people who would like to raise issues in the open forum. One is Nicola de Brett. Is she here tonight? No. Okay. Well, perhaps we'll come back to that. The other person who's raised the is Maria Safont. Is she here this evening? No. Okay. Well, let me just ask if anyone on the Zoom call would like to raise anything under the um, open forum. It doesn't look like so. it. May I just suggest that if people want to say something, I see Julia has raised her hand under the reactions button, which is a smiley face of a plus sign. There's a raise hand button and then the yellow hand pops up and you see there's like a queue of yellow hands. So I shall lower my hand and um, ask Julia if she would like to speak. Hi, sorry, uh, Juliana Moni. I'm resident in Camberley Avenue, and I was just wondering um, whether it would be possible to hear what the views are and the plans are for increased safety in the area. We've had a number of issues with um, theft and antisocial behaviour. Um, some of you may know that the um, sports hall um has been broken into previously there have been a fire issue there we've had kids basically thrashing things about and so on and so i was wondering what the plans are for this in terms of potentially having a cctv or anything like that okay thank you julia i know that councillor adam bush has been liaising with the safer neighborhood team so perhaps i can ask uh, adam to um say a few words about what he as understands the police are doing. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Julia. Um, so, yeah, I mean, residents are aware, I would probably say in the last two months, there's been two incidents there. Um, one was um, some um, youths were chased down from Carter's estate um, and they were caught um, at Cambly Avenue. Um, and arrested. The second was a couple of weeks ago where there was a 
um, catalytic converter stolen from um, Somerset Avenue. Um, I got alerted to that, this by a resident. Um, we contacted the police um, and they came back um, informing us that there was nothing stolen. Um, obviously that was totally inaccurate. Um, I spoke to the victim. I've been in touch with PC Georgia Hill, um, sent her an email three times last week and yet again today, so I'm eagerly chasing up a response. Um, having spoken to her, she is aware that there is an antisocial issue around those three um, roads. For me, it stems from two places. One is from the junction of the deluxe pizza. Um, there is a lot of cars parked there, gates and maybe uh, when um, Peter re reports back on the future of the high street, obviously that's uh, one point that could sort of filter through there. Um, there's often been a lot of fly tipping there and etc. We push for cameras, but we've been cited for funding issues. Um, 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 has stopped that. The second issue comes around from the Rains Park Sports Ground, where people are cutting through. We've sort of pushed towards trying to get a gates blocked off after hours and etc. Council officers are resistant to that, citing cost once again. We're hoping that the new lessee that takes over the sports ground will enforce some security there. So I know it sounds as if nothing is really being done. We are pushing as the police as to try and move, but it is quite a difficult situation. One hand, residents are saying install CCTV cameras, fly tipping and etc. Something that we want and we're pushing, but on the other hand, as the council is saying, we don't have the money. Um, so it is a difficult situation, but I am continuously pushing as the police. I am continuously pushing officers. I know sort of Tony Edwards is opposite it. So I don't know if there's something that we can do together with the Rains Park Association or something <laughs> to get um, council officers as to take more note. But obviously, yeah. Unfortunately, there isn't really a, it's an easy solution to this right now. I think the only real positive action that has been taken in truth is that the police have increased the rotation of their nighttime patrol cars. Um, I don't know if people realise, but the Safer Neighbourhood team only patrol Rains Park area during office hours. And during the evening, unless there is an emergency call out, the only police presence is the area patrol car moving around the wider Rains Park area. Well, the police have told us that they are increasing the kind of visits to the Cambly, Somerset, uh, Taunton Avenues. Um, it's not ideal, but it's, it's, it's at least helps a bit, I hope. Julia, do you want to say something else? Yeah, so on the police, I don't know how much truth there is to it, but we have a neighbourhood WhatsApp chat where all three streets chat with each other. And it seems that it's been less than, let's call it, brilliant response. Uh, it seems that there's been a report that a black BMW or something like that has been involved in that um, and apparently has stolen number plates. I do not know whether this is the case, but apparently that was what the residents were informed of. That car is still regularly parking here and we've been told apparently to reach out to them if this car appears and we've had literally the same bunch of people going in and out jumping in and out of this like I, I can count how many messages I have on here from neighbors say call the police again yeah so I feel what would be helpful is if um, a little bit more let's call it pressure can be exerted that number one they look into the facts of the matter because they still think maybe that it's not a real theft has occurred and so on so that the statistics are collected accurately so that when they make decisions about the safety of this area that they base it on real facts not on things where misunderstandings have taken place and number yeah. two that there's clarity in terms of what they expect the residents to do um because this is, should we be calling 
asking them if this car shows up, is it truly dodgy? I do not know, right? So it would be helpful if, if there's clear guidance given to people in terms of what they would like us to do to make the street safer as well, if that makes sense. So it's a two-pronged approach. Yeah, them to be responsible and us. Yeah, no, so Julia, um, in respect of that black vehicle, uh, if you could email me details of that, I can pick that up with Georgia separately and find out because uh, we are in um, correspondence right now. So I do have a attention for those roads. So if you drop me an email on adam.bush at merton.gov.uk, we can um, pick that up offline. It's, uh, so it's very easy to go online and check whether a car has been MOT'd or uh, paid road tax and therefore whether it's got insurance as well, because um, you can go on to Swansea and give them the number plate and check the status of the car to see whether it's fundamentally legal um, before you can obviously take further action. Yeah, um, it, it, thank you so much for your uh, efforts on, on this, Stephen and, and Adam. Um, and uh, it, uh, I think this is a real priority for the for the local area because um, I, kn I know that that little shopping parade has been a be, been an avenue for crime for, for, for quite a long time. I, I turned up there myself uh, a while ago and um, I was told uh, there was a huge commotion going on and uh, I asked what was happening and, and um, I was given this story about knife crime uh, taking place in connection with uh, youths from um, Rains Park High. Mm. Mm. Well, that, that is obviously a concern, school children with knives, they shouldn't be carrying knives, nobody should be. Um, I think I think Adam is, is be, being effective in liaising with the neighborhood, safer neighborhood team. So I think if we can leave it to Adam to bring up this issue of the black BMW and the registration number, um, and we hopefully we'll see some improvement in the situation. I think Perhaps now we will move on and I'll put to the meeting the issue that Nicola de Brett raised as an open forum discussion. Basically, Nicola's question was about um, the... Uh, sorry, I'm, I've lost my place for a moment. It was, it was a question really about our plans in Rains Park for improving cycling and uh, walking as opposed to um, increased traffic and traffic pollution. Um, and she asks, um, what are councillors doing to reduce the number of vehicle journeys in the area, pollution and congestion? So that was the issue that Nicola wanted to be raised. Um, I think the answer is that we have applied, that is the Rains Park Ward councillors, to the Ward Allocation Fund, which potentially gives us £15,000. And what we have done with that money, or asked for that money to be deployed on, is better marking of cycle lanes. Obviously, with only £15,000, it doesn't extend to improving the surface of the cycle lane along Coombe Lane. Um, but I think that is fundamentally what councillors are doing, unless any colleagues wish to um, add a response to this matter. Okay, um, moving on to the issue from Maria Safont. Um, she asks about the traveller encampment that has arrived um, at the Manu Plastic site in Kingston Road. Now, my understanding of that is that the council and police have been aware of it. It is, of course, private land, and the belief is that the developer who owns the land has gone to the High Court and obtained an injunction to remove these travellers from the site. Sadly, of course, the developer will be left with clearing any fly tipping that has been has occurred. 
But I think that is the answer to Maria's question. I don't know if anyone, any one on the call wants to comment. Adam. Yeah. Oh, Steve. Well, fly tipping and um, um, similar cases like that, um, as I think Mark can uh, remember back in 2018 when we had the um, campus site outside um, West Barnes area where it was full. And the difficulty tends to be is when they are situated on a private plot of land. So back in 2018, they were there for a week. We were liaising with council officers every day with the police. There was untaxed vehicles parked there. But as it was on private land, it was very difficult for them to take any actions. And sort of, unfortunately, four years down the line, when they did get sort of found and penalised, it was quite a small <laughs> fine. Um, so this is a national issue. Um, and if they happen to be on a site that's privately owned and they don't have the funds to remove them, uh, it really does come down to, unfortunately, residents having to um, bear with them. I recall in 2018, all the neighbours on the back of Thornton Avenue had absolute piles of rubbish, like three, four loads um, in the back garden. So, yeah. It's an unfortunate situation, really. Thank you. Matthew, I can see your hand raised. Um, of course, the issues with um, travellers and fly tipping affect um, the council in lots of places and other councils as well. But with this manual plastic site in particular, I think it, it does highlight how we really do need the council to do all it can to get an answer on Crossrail to one way or the other, because the site's been vacant for so long and that does encourage uh, this antisocial uh, behaviour. And I thank everyone on this call for uh, voting to at least invest in um, some exploratory work in that regard. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, um, and I think we can move on now to the other items on the agenda. Obviously, we're skipping over item three, Stephen Hammond. So let us move on to item four, uh, which is uh, the Wimbledon Guild and Olivia Mackay, who is going to speak to us about their Warm and Welcome programme. Olivia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Chris, for the invitation. So I am the Warm and Well Engagement Officer at Wimbledon Guild, and I organise the Warm and Well Project. So I basically just want to give a small overview on what the project is. I like to spread the word as many people that know about it as possible. If you think of anybody that you think this could apply to, please pass them on. Please do. So we started in January 2019 and we are funded by Merton Council in partnership with HUK Merton as well as Thinking Works. So we all have different parts to play. So I'll start with Thinking Works since they are the vast majority of what we do. So they are really the energy efficiency side. They do energy, energy assessments of the home, see how energy efficient it is, and they can also give specialist advice on making your home more energy efficient as well as lowering bills as well. When they do visits, they like to give out a little free bag just to get the ball rolling that normally has an LED light bulb, water saving shower heads, carbon monoxide monitors, things like that, just to re and radiate reflector panels as well make a huge difference because we lose a lot of heat through the wall so that really just gets them all started and they can also do referrals for emergency boiler repair if eligible which i'll go through in a minute as well as advice on discounts as well so we find that a lot of people in the borough are actually eligible for discounts that they're not they're not engaging with so for example the water help discount with thames water 50 percent off your water bill they you have to be on a low income which they define as in London boroughs, 20,111 specific, and outside of London, 16,480. So any individuals living on their own or with individuals that could be at risk or children and they're on that income, they would be eligible. So they would then be able to help them apply for that as well. And they also give um, fuel vouchers. So this is really where I come in. So we're finding at the moment with the increased price of fuel, which I'm sure is affecting us all, there's a lot of people across the borough having to choose between heating and eating. And in 2022, this is just not okay. So 
And what we tend to do is people can self-refer or they can be referred through a third party organization. I will then liaise with them, get a little bit more information, and then they're referred to Thinking Works. And if eligible, they get a 28 pound fuel voucher, which is a code, which is then redeemed at the post office and that's for gas and electric. So it is worth mentioning for the fuel vouchers, you do have to have prepayment meters. And I'll just go through the eligibility quickly. So Thinking Works do work in five boroughs, but for any referrals that come through me, you do have to be a Merton resident. And then you have to be one of the three. You don't have to be all three because that would be extremely niche. But you either have to be over 65, on a low income, or have a long-term health condition. So any of those, tick any of the boxes. And we also do tend to help carers as well. So there's that aspect to it. So that's really thinking works in a nutshell. Energy efficiency. I also manage the Handy Person Project. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but once I tell them, they get very excited. So... The Handy Person is a free service in Merton for Merton residents only. And it's an individual called Chris. Some of you may have met him. He's employed by Merton Council. So he will do anything that doesn't require a professional. So he'll put up shelves, curtain poles, reseal the bathtub, grab rails, anything like that. He will move light furniture and anything that is considered a two-person job. So in previously, he's managed to get with his partner Curtis, he's managed to get the um, furniture out to the front of the house for council collection, things like that. Again, any referrals to those, they just go through me. So I will pop my email in the, in the chat. Now, there is an eligibility criteria for that as well. So as mentioned, you do have to be a Merton resident and then you either have to be over 65 or have a long-term health condition. And one of the three, one of the two, and you're fine. And then there's Age UK Merton who are similar to CAB, who are currently very overwhelmed at the moment. So it's excellent that they're doing the same thing. When they can give advice on benefits as well, they're not legally trained, but they can be able to assess the individual circumstances and see what benefits you could be eligible for that you're not, you're not engaging with. And that's pretty much it in a, in a nutshell, really. Excellent. Thank you, Olivia. Um, has anyone got any questions they would like to ask Olivia? I, I, oh, Adam. Uh, thank you, Olivia, for, for that um, um, presentation. Um, just a question for me. So it's obviously it's a fantastic service, everything. How do we raise awareness and how do people get in touch in terms of, uh, because, I mean, service, but sort of how do we sort of push it out to the residents? Yeah, so we, if you could just spread the word, that would be fantastic. I do have hard copy materials. I'm happy to distribute to anybody that needs them or would like them. We do have A4 information packs as well. And inside is all the relevant information. And I do distribute those across the borough specifically to individuals in Merton Council, the CLCH, organisations, things like that. So I've got a lot of different contacts all over the borough. So more is always excellent. So yes, if you do want anything, please do let me know and I can arrange a delivery. In terms of getting in touch, I will pop my email in the chat. So an email's perfect. And you can call Wimbledon Guild Mainland line, which I will also put in the chat. Thank you. Claire, would, do you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to check, is there any charge for the handy person service? It's completely free. Brilliant. That, that is a very good service, isn't it? A free handy man, yes. Um, Danny, do you have a question? Hello, Olivia, not, not really a question, just more, well, I'm more than happy to help you promote the, uh, our libraries. If you want to send some posters through for that, that's no problem at all. Fantastic. Brilliant. I'll pop my email in the chat, as I said, and if you could just email me with the information, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Good. Good. Well, I have personal experience of the Wimbledon Guild. My mother came down from, from Scotland as an elderly lady, and they were wonderful, and I was very grateful for the um, help they provided my mother in settling in, and, um, you know, when she was in the community, she used to pop up to the Wimbledon Guild on the Walpole Road for lunch and had a wonderful time there. Fantastic. That's wonderful to hear. Um, 
I just uh, mentioned that uh, Mark Gale has put something in the chat box about um, the Travellers and Merton Council going to the High Court and getting orders preventing Travellers using Merton Council land. And he points out that this arrangement ended on the 12th of December. I don't know whether it has been renewed. Um, I'm sure we can find out. I don't actually believe it costs a great deal of money to go to the High Court and get one of these injunctions granted. I mean, I think we're talking no more than a couple of thousand pounds. So I would imagine it probably has happened. But I think we can find out and we perhaps can include it in the minutes of the meeting, Chris, along, of course, with um, the Wimbledon Guild contact numbers. Um, <clears throat> So I think now we move on to item five on the agenda, which is called business matters. And the first of our two business matters is the high street task group that was um, organized by the council and, and chaired by councillor Peter Southgate. So I'm a hoax, Peter Southgate, councillor Southgate is here tonight. So I'll ask him to um, explain what the task group was all about. Peter, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Stephen. Um, it all started long ago, as, as uh, Councillor Bush will recall, um, as a member of the task group. And thank you, Adam, for your your, your work on the on the task group uh, back in June twenty twenty. So we we've, we've taken a long time to get to where we are. I'm, um, but other things have come along in in that interval. In particular, the the council's Your Merton initiative, um, which is a, a very big project indeed, plus certain amounts of funding for um, uh, the future Merton team for uh, specific high street improvements. And really all of these things are traveling in the same direction. They are about um, the, the high street, it started off as the future of the high street, actually, it's now rechristened as the repurposing of the high street. We do realize uh, high streets were struggling before the pandemic. Um, as a consequence of the pandemic, the people's views of the high street have changed and to an extent they are more, rather more affectionate, if you like, to, towards their high street. So, it's going to be less about shopping in future. It's going to be much more about its role as, as, as a community hub. If I'm trying to give it to you in a, a nutshell, that, that's it, really. Um, I, I better caveat what I say, though, by saying that the report went to Cabinet last night. Uh, I, Cabinet are not bound to accept our recommendations. However, they have formed a... Let me just... Um, here we are. Um, an officer work, officers working group uh, to, to, to work with local partner organisations to carry the, 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 the recommendations forward into an implementation plan. So, uh, I mean, that, that, that's good news in so far as it carries us over from this council to the next one. Uh, specifically, I will not be seeking re-election and the cabinet member is not seeking re-election. So at least there, there is continuity there. And, and I was very pleased to get this into the last cabinet meeting of, of, of the council. Um, the findings on, I don't think you're going to find them surprising really. They are, they are things that you, 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 you mentioned. Um, they are the, the importance, for example, of uh, arts and cultural events in, in uh, injecting life into the high street and indeed into bringing the community together. Um, we have made a recommendation that there should be funding for town centre managers, not necessarily one for each of the, the, uh, the, the five high streets, but we, we have had town centre managers in the past and they have performed a useful role and they they would be the link between the businesses and the uh, and the council uh, in, in more than just the sort of regulatory 
fashion. So it's not 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 somebody just to go along and say you can't put that A board out. It would be uh, a manager to um, try and encourage the businesses to run local promotional events. Uh, specifically, I do remember this coming out of the discussions we had with with you in Rains Park. Um, there will be um, an online presence or a digital offer. Uh, uh, Future Merton are already looking at that that could be used by local businesses to to promote their um, their, their presence and uh, which could also be used to publicise local events that are coming up. So um, that's a positive. We're very keen to, we think the world is changing, um, to attract uh, entrepreneurs onto the high street uh, with, with innovative ideas. We think that the, uh, you know, the five-day-a-week commute is, a, is going to be a thing of the past. There will be more people, what's it been called, the, the great retirement, um, who opt out of the, 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 the salaried lifestyle and want to do something perhaps on a lesser scale and more locally, and they will be looking to local spaces in which to do that. I'm not saying exactly form what form they might take, but Wimbledon, which operates uh, above Wimbledon Library, is, is a good example. We're quite encouraged by what Romulus have been saying about their plans for Centre Court in Wimbledon to include within that uh, spaces for small businesses. Um, the other... Point and this is this is not so easy for Rains Park. Um, the green agenda. We we are very keen to find ways of linking the high street into nearby green spaces. Um, so if we're looking at Morden, you've got a, a, a splendid parks either side in Morden Hall Park and Morden Park, and we we just feel there should be better ways of signposting linkages and indeed putting more more greenery onto the high street, be that parklets or um, uh, planting bays in, in car parks, that kind of thing. The, all of this might sound like the sort of thing you, you would want to do in any and every high street. I think the difference comes when you start thinking about the history of, of each high street. Um, and we do see this as very much the thing that provides the, the unique profile uh, for, for each high street. Um, the thing indeed that will build people's affection for their high street and make them feel they belong to it. Um, we haven't been able to, you know, to, to say quite where that, that might, might start in the case of Rains Park. I was thinking about Rains Park. Uh, before the Weatherspoons closed down, was, was it the Rialto cinema, if we go back? Mm. Yes, um, I yeah. do, rem do, re do remember going to see Gone with the Wind there. Not when it first came out, but um, so so I mean, people love those <laughs> historical details, and, and they do. You know, it, it just sort of cements your affection for the high street, and that that's what we want to to build. Um, I do remember the, the and very good to see people like Chris Larkin and Tony Edwards here tonight, that we had a very good, productive uh, discussion, actually. And I think the main thing that I took out of that was the, um, the very effective way in which the Rains Park Association does seem to operate and to bring together both resident interests and businesses. And that, uh, that that's valuable. It doesn't, it doesn't work out elsewhere like that. For example, I would say in Wimbledon, we don't have that uh, level of cooperation and, and um, common purpose in, in, in working to, to further the interests of the, of the high street. Um, so the, uh, the report is, is quite brief when we come to the individual town centres, and that will be worked up by, by officers um, who will then sort of set about coming up with a, a plan for, for each of the, the five town centres. And whilst I won't be around to see that, well, actually, I, I will be certainly taking a close interest in it because it's been a, a, a good project to do and, I, and I've enjoyed it. And I think it's, 
it's all part and parcel about um, the fact that life is going to look very different. Um, we're not quite sure what shape it will take yet, I don't think, but that there is the opportunity there to to build a greater sense of of community. It's not um, it, it's not about it's not about chain stores. It's much more about uh, creating space for, for socialising, small scale informal gatherings, and and things that, that people want to do. And which indeed I notice you already do very well in Rains Park with with the uh, the, the festival. So that's that's uh, about all I have to say, Stephen. I think on the, um, the the work of the task. Other than to thank you for your your contributions, thank Adam in particular for his support on the on the task group. Thank you, Peter. I'd, I'd like to thank you for leading the task group and all the task group members for their input. I mean, it is something of a challenge we face in the high street. I mean, as we all know, in Rains Park, we have gone from a two banks and four pubs to two pubs and no banks. So that is a of the high street changing and um, one hopes that based on the task group's report, some initiatives can be forthcoming to, as it were, arrest and reverse the decline which appears to have been happening. Um, but let me uh, invite um, members on the call to um, ask Peter any questions, if they have any questions. Adam. Um, Stevie, yeah, no, um, it's obviously just a brief one. Um, can I just obviously thank Peter for chairing the task group very well. Uh, we obviously went around different areas Wimbledon, Rains Park, Mission Morden, and the way that you chaired it, first of all, um, speaking all of our thoughts, um, calling in the council officers and the community groups was well done. And um, I just hope that we can build on the plans that we've done. And because prior to 2020, the high street was fine, but it wasn't at the centre thought of the council officers. But by bringing this task group to the officer's mind and into cabinet has sort of prioritises the approach. So no, thank you for your work on that, Peter. No, thank you, Adam. And I think the momentum is there now, actually. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I see Tony Edwards and then Claire. Tony. Um, just to correct that the government has obviously got a high street task force of its own um, with pilot projects, etc. Um, is there any suggestion that Merton could make grant applications to this government funded task force, as it were, to see whether there is another source of implementing some of these changes. I should certainly ask that question, Tony, before I <laughs> step down as chair. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I have to be honest, I was not aware of that. I, I am aware that we are putting fairly substantial sums aside for what, what has now become Merton's 2030 vision, of, of which the high street is is a key part but uh, if, if there is external government funding we we should certainly be applying for it yeah because i think i think the government has obviously seen well i suppose um it may be coupled with the fact that they were giving business rates income to local authorities at the very time that high streets were collapsing in some cases and there was that famous shopping center that got sold for a pound um, and clearly, retail values have been plummeting and we're buying online. And so there is a real crisis in almost every high street where they're all going to look like ghost towns. Um, I mean, we've, we were uh, at the Rains Park Association quick to stop another shutter going down in front of a shop that was like a nail bar, you know, because so many, I doubt that all the places we see where the shutters down got planning consent for those shutters i think the sort of the horse has bolted on that one but you don't really want your high streets to look at night as if they're expecting some kind of civil commotion and siege so that these small things make a difference to the character of the spaces we're trying to create so um again the government itself has been um looking at high streets as a general problem and i hope that um, there may be a mechanism whereby some kind of support mm. advice and funding um, can be channeled to Merton to assist in your work as well. And by the way, it was, thank you. It was very good of you to come and speak to us as well. And then we, we hope some of the points we made we'll see in your report. Yes, thank you, Tony. Yeah. Well, I presumably the Rains Park Association, when you talk about partner organisations, that, that is the Rains Park Association, is it? 
as a partner organization? Uh, yes, and yes. Right, yeah. that's good to hear. Thank you. Mm. Claire, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, it was just following actually on from what Tony said. It's about business rates and, and encouraging um, people to come into Rains Park. That, you know, what I've heard so often is the business rates are so high that we just can't afford to open a shop locally or a business locally. So I suppose it's, it's how do we make it accessible to people? Mm. It's quite interesting in his initial response last night, um, the Councillor Owen Pritchard is, is the cabinet member. He certainly raised the question of business rates. Um, getting that change is a bit above my pay grade, but uh, <laughs> I think he was making the point that, it, that this is something that government should, should be looking at. And we are, are aware of... Uh, but the, the, there have been exemptions for smaller businesses, haven't there, for, for some some time now. And um, I think making smaller spaces is available is, is, is one thing, but of course that only suits certain types of business. So it, it really does need a rather more fundamental reform of the whole, whole system, perhaps moving on to um, more of a sales tax so that that captures the, the online um, element in, in in the retail mix too. Yes, maybe the Chancellor will have something to say on the subject tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. Would you like to uh, say something? Uh, yeah, I think that central government grants were involved in the two parklets, Lime and Time, and by the Skew Arch. So that might have been high street funding. And um, I was interested in what Councillor Southgate said about obviously big green spaces, and we do have Prince George's playing fields so with the boundary changes in the ward it'd be really great to see um you know if we can bring prince george's playing fields along prince george's because obviously that will take people to the green space but you'll also get people from the green space to the high street i think that this idea of of um the historical landmarks in an area the the thought was we could perhaps develop trails that would, would lead you from one to another and then on to an available green space um, easier in some places than others, but but we do we do want people to realise those spaces are there. It's not just the immediate high street. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think we've uh, covered this topic. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to your task group. Um, so, so, moving on, um, the next item on the agenda is claiming. For COVID concession, is that you, Tony? Uh, afraid it is. Yes, it was um, just really picking up. I'm, I'm the uh, messenger for the council on this one. Really, um, the council has been given about four point seven million pounds from the government to provide support to businesses who weren't covered by the previous hospitality or entertainment support as well. These are, these were businesses who've been adversely affected but weren't picked up in those other designations. Um, so it went to Cabinet on 17th, uh, 7th of February, and it's a live uh, exercise at the moment where businesses have to make a submission. Um, the thing is, the, the submission has to be made by 5 p.m. on the 30th of March. So you've got to be in it to sort of win it. Um, and this will be... What's awarded will be some adjustment to your future rates. It won't be a back payment. It will be uh, some concession on future rates. So all businesses need to be alert to this window of opportunity to try and make the application. The, the link is on the agenda. So if you go there, you can find the criteria and what's required and how to make your submission. You, you know, if you're a company, you need your company number. If you're paid VAT, you've got to put your VAT registration number. So there are a number of things you have to do in order to get through this. Um, but uh, again, it won't be a massive discount. Uh, I think it may be in the range of 10%. It depends how many people make the application. But I think Merton thought there were, might be at least um, 250 different businesses that might qualify for this fund. So obviously the more that qualify, 
the more divided the sum becomes, as it were. But um, every little helps, as they say. So um, if you know of anybody who runs a business and thinks they um, would worth their while make an application, remember to do it by the 30th of March. That was that one. Thank you, Tony. And presumably this is being communicated by the Merton Chamber of Commerce to all its business members. I guess so. Um, I mean, we, we got connected directly by the council and we've made our application already. Um, I can't remember where the emails came from because there are uh, always a worry that someone doesn't look at something or doesn't read the mail and doesn't register it. Um, there was advance notice of this in, in emails that we got and then um, we were still waiting because as it went to cabinet on the 7th, they had to sort out some software before it went live. So time was marching on, um, but we um, picked up on it. And obviously we're not the only businesses doing it, but say, I think the thing is to go to the Merton Gov Coronavirus Business Grants CAF website, as it were, and pick up all the information from there directly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hopefully those who need to know this have, have got the message. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. So we move on now to item six on the agenda, which is an update on the library service. And I believe Danny McDonald, who is amongst other things responsible for the Rains Park Library, um, is here to tell us about the library service. Danny. Ah, huh. maybe Danny isn't here. I see a Danny, but I'm assuming that isn't the Danny in question. No, it was, Danny is here. Yes, I've seen him. I've seen yeah. him. I was just stepped away for a moment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, let's come back to that then, the library, and we'll go on to item seven on the agenda, which is the disposal of the Rains Park sports ground. Chris, are you speaking to this? Uh, no. Was that... Uh, again, Tony. I think what Jackie got a response on that. Um, I think the there was a concern about the disposal uh, and a number of concerns. And I think um, Jackie, as our Rains Park champion, got a sort of formal response to perhaps pacify people on uh, access and the other issues that the council was alert to some of these concerns. And in um, a, arranging a new lease with uh, a new party, these concerns will be picked up before the finalisation. I don't think the lease has been finalised yet, but these points of concern were, um, with due diligence as it were, going to be incorporated as well. So as far as I know, um, everything has been put forward there with these concerns and should be picked up in the final lease terms. Can I just come in at that point? Um, yeah, I mean, everything that you've, you've just said there is, is correct. Um, we're, we're looking to um, let the site um, in the near future, um, following the, the marketing exercise last year, um, and the notice that people will have seen recently that, that was in the paper and is on the website, was to let you know that the, the public open space there is the intention to let it, um, and, and to let us know have any comments. I've had quite a few emails with comments, most of which have been very positive. Um, as you say, the, the concerns that have been raised with regard to footpaths and the cycleway and that those won't be affected um, but any comments that you that you want to make um, that is still open until Thursday so um, do drop me emails if, if you have anything that you'd like me to address and, and pass that on. Okay um, does anyone have any uh, comments or questions in relation to the Rains Park sports ground? Mm. Simon, Councillor McGar. Hello, Simon. Did you wish to say something? No, maybe not. Um, can I say, J Jackie got a formal reply as an email. Perhaps I can put that on to, to Chris for the purposes of the minutes and he can extract anything from that formal response as part of the minutes. Is that OK with you, Jackie? Yeah, that's fine. OK, excellent. I just have a kind of one question myself on the Reigns part sports ground. I had understood that it was quite prone to the tension of surface water and that the people who were playing rugby on the uh, sports ground in the winter months often had a, a run of cancelled fixtures because of this surface water. 
Is that anything you, you know about and how it might be um, mitigated? I, I don't know details of that, I'm afraid. I mean, it's certainly something that we can mention to the, the new tenants. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they will be aware of it um, and it's something that they will probably pick up, but I can certainly raise it, but I, I'm not aware of um, any proposals. Fine. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, well, I think that covers the Ains Park Sports Ground. So now we'll return to the update on the library service. I think we've re-established connection with Danny. So welcome back, Danny. Um, and over to us about the library. Yeah, so apologies uh, to start with. I was having a bit of um, headphone hell. So I've managed to get a set that's working properly. And uh, yeah, I'll just dive straight in to the library's plus updates. So uh, since November 2021, Merton Libraries has been piloting a new technology in which customers are requested to scan their library cards and type their PIN numbers in to enter between the hours of 9.30 and 1. And this pilot has been running across four, Mer four of Merton's branch libraries. So that's Collierswood, Brains Park, Pollard's Hill and West Barnes. And uh, during the pilot, staff members of the library uh, have been at the front supporting customers with any issues in terms of getting through the doors. Uh, we've had a few technical hitches with the technology and that's part of what the pilot was about to just sort of check uh, its uh, robustness, shall we say. And obviously to help customers uh, by providing them new cards if they're not already registered with the library so we can get them through the door uh, to issue them their card. Uh, so we've been kind of doing that to minimise any issues for, for any of our, our residents. And uh, yeah, so whilst there have been a few technical glitches, um, we believe the pilot has run very well and customers on the whole uh, are happy uh, to use this technology. And part of the reason why we've got it in place is to uh, allow us to extend our opening hours. So from April 4, we'll be able to run uh, have our libraries open from 8 a.m. But between 8 a.m. and 9.30, the library will be operating unstaffed. Uh, so any sort of self-service in interactions customers need to do with the library, they can. And um, yeah, as I say, that'll be an operation from April 4. Um, so what, I've, what we've understood from some of our residents is that um, there's been some concern that the technology will mean a reduction in library staff. So I can make it clear that there are no plans for library staff reductions. The technology does mean that security staff would not need to be present between 9.30 and 1. However, the new um, security contract team profile have been consulting with them and finding them other hours at other sites. So one of those other sites is Merton Council and they'll also be moving across those four branch sites. So that consultation is actually still going on and um, it's likely that they will um, be able to find them the same hours, if not more, uh, at different sites. And so I thought I would just move on to um, uh, the health and wellbeing events that have been running at Merton Libraries recently. So uh, we recently won an additional grant for funding to invest in health and wellbeing services. Uh, so this has gone towards uh, a roster of sort of events taking place across all of Merton Libraries called Mindspace. I don't know if anyone's come across those, but they've included things like over 60s fitness classes and uh, yoga and um, all sorts of other events to uh, sort of help with uh, physical health for residents. And this will be moving on to uh, uh, health technology, which will be placed within all of our libraries. So we're looking at um, installing a health monitor, which uh, customers will be able to go in and measure things like their, their pulse, their blood oxygen levels, their body mass index. And um, this data would actually feed directly into their GPs as well, uh, if they have their GP contact details with them. So uh, yeah, that funding is sort of, I mean, going towards those sort of things. And um, as part of the council's sort of um, shared objective with libraries for health and well-being, we feel like this is going to be a good push towards that objective. Um, and then finally, I will just touch on COVID-19 a little bit. So we've been operating without any social distancing or mask requirements. However, we are still keeping the cleaning of all our books just to try and reduce the spread of infection. 
And uh, we also monitor our CO2 levels and we're, we're able to sort of increase airflow whenever we feel those levels are high. They all seem to be fine at the moment, but it is something we keep an eye on. Um, and with these restrictions dropped, it's obviously meant that we've been able to increase our offers of events and activities in general. So um, it's been a really sort of uplifting experience at the libraries at the moment because we're just able to bring all those things back that we haven't been able to do. And I think actually we're seeing far more participation than we did pre-pandemic. So um, we've got, at Rains Park Library specifically, we've started to get chess, uh, chess group going. Um, lots of different art groups that are taking place and um, as part of our Jane Austen month in April we're even going to be having ballroom dancing lessons at uh, Rains Park Library Hall and these are these are always free so um, it's it's great just to get people in and using the using the space for as a community hub and providing all these um, free activities so um, something that we've uh, looked into since getting these activities back up and running again is um, booking. So now we handle all our bookings for Eventbrite and that's a, a great platform for us to just promote all these activities that are taking place. So yeah, I do recommend just going on to the Merton Library's Eventbrite just to see all the different things um, we have going really. And um, yeah, there's going to be more and more stuff in the future. Uh, there's going to be a language tutor coming in soon who's interested in doing some free courses. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, just keep an eye out for that, really. And just on a personal level, I'd like to thank you for uh, letting me attend today. Um, Anthony obviously sends his apologies, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Excellent. Well, well thank you for attending tonight, Ian, and, and, and sorry, Danny. And um, That's fine. <laughs> um, I just like to say how pleased one is to hear that the that the library service is coming out of, of COVID, mm. all inspiring with new initiatives, new yeah, tech. Absolutely. And, and for residents. Uh, mm. So it's wonderful news for the community. It really is, it really is. I see Claire has raised her hand. Uh, Claire. Thank you. I mean, it sounds really, really exciting, Danny. I mean, you're saying like eight to 9.30 is unstaffed. 9.30 onwards. So I, I suppose I'm thinking of our older community and managing the um, clocking in or, 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 or keying in. Mm -hmm. So you're saying from 9.30 onwards, you don't have to do that anymore. You can, you can go to the front desk. No, so from 9.30, uh, between 9.30 and 1, customers are still requested to scan their library cards yeah. to enter. Now... 99% of the time, there is, going to be a, there is going to be staff presence. But there might be an odd occasion where if someone's on annual leave and someone's on well, then it will be left. Okay, but it's going to be very rare where that does happen. And obviously, we're just going to continue supporting residents in using the technology. And it's quite like um, just a self-service uh, supermarket. You know, you have to just scan your shopping that way. Here, you're just scanning your cards, and then it's a four-digit PIN number. So... We feel it is quite an easy technology to get along with, but yes, there are always going to be some some barriers which do come up. And um, yeah, obviously, we just want to minimise that as much as possible. And yeah, that, that, I do understand that concern. So with feedback that you've had so far with the pilot, how mm. how has it shown you the, the uh, okay, the people who can manage that? What about the people who can't? Are you getting... Are you getting really good feedback about that? Well, we, we obviously do get some feedback of people that, that struggle to use it, but we're finding that it doesn't really outweigh how many people are okay with it. So obviously, yeah, it's, an unavoidable, it's, it's been an unavoidable sort of technology that we kind of needed to put in place for savings. I'm not going to try and skirt around that. But certainly we feel um, it's... It's kind of hard to explain. I suppose it's just that it's it's just a sort of necessary evil, I guess, in in in, in some ways. And um, we we sort of feel like it's it, the way the technology works. It minimises how much impact it would have on residents who who, who struggle with it, because yeah. there will always be a staff member available. Uh, well, I say always. Most of the time, we'll be able to get people through the door anyway. Because. 
I, I hear that I hear that point and yeah, I, yeah. and I, I recognize that point. I suppose mm. it's just what is happening to those few people who oh, no. have access quiet, have access it? libraries before who now find it really hard and and, and what support said, might be being uh, put in for them. Remember sorry, I, uh <laughs> there was a weird sound then. Uh, there was, there was. Um, and it wasn't me for a change. Did, uh, did you hear my point? Or I, 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 I did. And the, the only support there would be that staff members will let them in and we'll keep showing them how that technology works. And we'll just try and reinforce uh, how it works. And that, and that really, that really would be it. Yeah, I suppose I, I recognise how... I recognise the value of the service that you're putting in. I do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I I just feel that there's an awful lot of of local people who will have used that library in the mornings as mm -hmm. a regular um, service who may find it a challenge now. So I just really hope that there is sufficient <coughs> support for them mm -hmm. to be able to mm -hmm. carry on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we're providing that support um, ninety nine percent of the time, as I say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. That's okay. Thank you. Um, Mark Gale, would you like to say something, and then Chris Larkman? Yes, please. Um, so, from the twenty twenty two to twenty twenty six business plan, and there's a link I've put in the chat for it. Um, it says that the idea of this. Um, get, get access to, into the park, into the library is for implement new self-service offer and provide staffless library offer at four branch libraries. I don't think they're trying to say that it's going to be staffed still. That that's the whole point of the how they're explaining their cuts in the service to to obviously keep those libraries open. Um, well, obviously that is a concern and I would need to look over that business report again. I mean, from our understanding is that we, there are no, there is no plans to get rid of any staff, but we are obviously operating some hours where it will be staffless. So, and then on top of I that, I think a bit of clarity would be, yeah, on top of that, they what do they mean? Do they mean completely staffless? They put out procurement for this service, telling obviously who they're, procuring from that they want to go, go staffless so for the last five years this has been sh shouted at but from the live from the council and you know it's in the current business plan saying this is what's happening in these four libraries mm -hmm. they haven't mm -hmm. hidden it mm -hmm. at all well, well i'd like clarification on what did it, with the staff because we've got a staffless offer from from next week so do they mean staffless during the entire period of our open hours? Or do they mean extending our hours using staffless periods? So yeah, that would be something I'd, I'd query that with Anthony because as far yeah. as he's made me aware, there's no plans to get rid of staff ever in, in the short or long term. Check out the link in the chat, page 285 we'll, we'll business plan, which will give we'll you do. reassurance yeah. or concern. Thank, <laughs> concern. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Department. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether by staffless, would there still be trained volunteers there at that time? That is a good question. And um, with volunteers, we would be happy to have adult volunteers there if they're willing to come in at 8am, which I'm not sure how many would. But um, yeah, I, we, we are okay to have adult volunteers, but certainly not anyone under the age of um, 18. So basically, what you're saying is there may be <coughs> nobody in the library with any mm -hmm. authority, whether they're paid or volunteers, for, for a period, possibly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's right. The, the other thing is, I've come back to you so many times on this, the toilet mm -hmm. availability. I knew this was coming. Um, I'm prepared for this. <laughs> I know you know that would be coming <laughs> from me. Um, but the, when the library was built, and, and I campaigned for it, it was built on the site of public toilets and the toilets there have always been seen as public toilets. Um, now, you know, I can go along with what you're saying. It sounds as if you're bending over backwards 
to make the library as available as possible. My fear about having this swipe in system is that it would deter a lot of people, but it's sounding as if you're, you're doing all that you can to make it available. I hope you'd also say to people who <coughs> use your toilet from time to time, you're very welcome. You might want to join the library so that you can more easily access it. Um, our basic starting point is that those toilets are not for library users, whatever you guys say. It, it, they are there for anybody in Rains Park. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. I mean, you've stumped me there. There's not really much I can say in response. Um, we have to do this entry system. It's, it's, it's a way of just us reducing costs and those toilets are situated inside the library. So as, as I say, um, there, there is always a staff member there. And if for some reason someone doesn't have their card, we can let them in. Of course, there is that 1% chance, but it might not be. And then between the hours of eight and 9.30, the con what we've consulted with facilities at Merton Council is that it's unsafe for those toilets to be unlocked for anyone to come in between 8 and 9.30. And that's because if there's an accident, then there's no one there to respond to them. And that's more relating to the disabled toilet. But at the end of the day, it, it could happen in, in the regular toilets as well. Right. I mean, that'll be a difficult thing for you to manage, but the... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, yeah. And I think that's an interesting point about the toilets. I was unaware of that myself. Can I just ask, is there any intention to extend opening hours into the evening? Yeah, uh, there's certainly no intention at the moment, but it's definitely an idea that we're looking at. We might look at extending into evenings. I think more likely we'll be looking into opening on Wednesdays, because at the moment we're always closed on Wednesdays, so that I, I imagine that being the next step, but in the future, possibly evenings as well. I think we want to sort of take it little steps at a time just to see, you know, how, uh, how customers respond to using the library in a staffless environment. Um, I, I would add that there is CCTV in operation and they, the CCTV is monitored as well. So, um, yeah, it's just about, yeah, little steps before we start walk before we run kind of thing. <laughs> I remember when the 24-hour um, gym was proposed for basement site next to the old Edward Lane pub. I'm not suggesting that gyms and libraries are comparable, but there was a great deal of concern expressed about an unmanned, unstaffed 24-hour gym. Yeah. And in practice, it doesn't seem to have been the problem for the gym. Now, maybe mm -hmm. that Maybe it isn't. I just, I just no. I mean, that seems to be a model that has worked for them. I used to use, um, uh, I think, I think it's a gym just called Gym Group in Tooting, and they were staffless, twenty-four hour. You know, you typed a code in, you went in, and everyone seemed respectful. I didn't really That's see any time. issues when I was using that area. So yeah. Super. Jay, did you wish to say something, Jay Cuthbert? No, thank you. Bye. Michael Ball, I see your hand up. Thanks, Stephen. Danny, could, could I just ask, um, over a sort of 10-year uh, period, um, uh, what attendance is like at the library? Um, it, it, the, the, the number of uh, visitors, um, obviously sort of taking out the, um, taking out the, the, the pandemic, which was obviously an exceptional event mm. but mm -hmm. um has attendance generally been on the rise or or the decline thanks a lot thank you you're welcome you're welcome michael and uh yeah it has been on the decline i'm not gonna lie so this is you know part of what we're doing we have to kind of reach out to the community and kind of uh respond to what their needs are you know it's no good just sort of saying well we give books out and that's it this is why we've sort of become this kind of community hub we're running all these different activities and we're trying to sort of measure the impact of those activities and um to you know to see whether they are well received by the community and if that's sort of the way forward but yeah no that's always one of our challenges we have monthly reports on visitor figures and we're always sort of tracking those at the door with part of the tech that's with libraries plus and um 
But yeah, no, on the decline on the past over the past ten years. Thank. Well, it seems library services entering into a new and interesting phase in its development, and I wish it well. And thank you very much for coming to speak to us at this evening. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so we now move on to what is termed general updates. And I think this is a double header involving Chris Larkman and uh, Tony Edwards. So over to you. Hi, everybody again. Um, isn't it great news? The land transfer is happening at the station. Um, you've been bored stiff by me going on about it for the last 15 years, and I will not have to talk to you again about it. It's two very small bits of land um, at the southern exit, so that there's enough room for pedestrians at that point, and a small bit on the north side of the skew arch. Um, Merton Council are now putting it into action, and no thanks to Network Rail for the dreadful amount of time they've taken in agreeing something that is just so simple and obvious. Um, but we still go on on all the other issues, clearing rubbish from the embankments and also the um, planting on the north side um, and the Network Rail are going to put in a gate to allow some of us volunteers to manage that site. And we've been wanting to do that again for many years. So watch this space. In terms of the kiss and ride, I'm still very angry that it's been erected, but there's no parking regulations. And I can say that um, our MP Stephen Hammond and I are going to be meeting with people from Workspace who are responsible for setting this up to ask them what they're planning to do and hopefully get something happening fairly soon. Um, the parklet at Lyme and Time um, has been taken out temporarily uh, because of Thames Waterworks. Um, that's all I've got to say. Tony Edwards may have some other issues. Thank you. Before you say your bit, Matthew, did you wish to say something? I thought, thought your hand was raised. I was just doing applause for Chris and Tony and my fingers said, well done on all your hard work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well said. Excellent. Tony, over to you. Um, yes, I, th there's a, a number of things come together and, and I suppose it explains to try to get things sorted. You can't really do it in a silo approach, but the proposal for a new public realm space um, if we particularly look at the skew arch, the south of the skew arch, where, where Matthew's done great work and we've, we've so far achieved a, a great enhancement there, but there is potentially more that could be done because when we first met with Matthew there and, and we met other councillors there, it was quite evident that the, the pavement area could be made bigger and that piece of dual carriageway could be single carriageway it was eminently sensible. It's been in the enhancement plan for over 10 years now. So whenever we speak about it, we probably ought to start with once upon a time, there was a proposal for an enhanced public realm space there. The interesting thing that's coming up now though, and this is a little hot off the press, people will remember that we had uh, Thames Water at the Bellmouth um, in January, it might have met people there. And the RPA carried on a, a dialogue there. Um, one of the things we're talking about was the idea of rain gardens, where as part of the enhancement of the environment, there was a way in which you could actually get surface water to be taken uh, into the ground and dispersed better than it does at the moment. Because I'm not sure whether the High Street Task Force mentioned it, but having a high street that's flooded three times in five years is not exactly a great retail experience for anybody, including high business rates. So if we can actually sort out some of the flooding, that would be important. Um, the Thames, uh, Merton applied for some funding to try to uh, look at uh, strategies for flooding um, and were turned down because at 300,000, it was seen to be too much. Uh, Merton is going to be making a fresh application this in April 
to with another schemes uh, to see what we can be achieving there. And uh, we're going to be having a dialogue with them as per emails of today to see whether the Rains Park Association, Thames Water and Merton could put their heads together to find some ways in which there are changes to the public realm, which will also solve some of the flooding proposals. So we're trying to join all these things together. So you have the skew arch area partially improved, but could be better. Thames Water maybe could provide some funding for it. Um, also, if the skew arch area is enlarged and we get something beneficial there, it would be great to, to advertise for traders or market stalls to also say, you can go across the road to the library and use the toilets. So that's another facility that links up as well. So we've got the potential at the end of the skew arch to do something quite positive if we can just find a way of making it purposeful and get some funding for it as well. So um, the, the RPA is going to be putting all our efforts into this dialogue to see what can be achieved as well. So um, we'd have to watch this space, really. OK, thank you very much, Tony. I do like the idea of the master plan involving library toilets. <laughs> it hinges on small things. Yes, great. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask uh, Chris or Tony or any comments on what has just been said? Michael Bull. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, Tony, I, I don't know whether you've given any um, thought to um, a green wall uh, above the AstroTurf um near the skew arch uh because i've always thought that um that that would be a great location for a for a green wall to um to uh add towards the the greenification of of rains park as discussed by peter uh earlier on um generally if we do that, which is a good idea, I think we have to be slightly uh, renegade about how we do it. Um, the, uh, um, the railway company don't like things attached to their structures in general. So um, Matthew could probably explain something about that. It takes a bit of negotiation to touch their structures. So I think what we need to do is not so much fix something where you need a certain type of climber on it, but we need a self-clinging climber to be planted at the foot of these walls. Uh, and maybe we can just improve the soil at the bottom. And then we can actually start to get a green wall, which is sustainable in those sort of the arches. I mean, it's, it's an interesting structure and it could be lit differently. And there's all sorts of possibilities. I mean, once we get the ball rolling on making that a public realm space, um, your suggestions and others could make it really lively 24-7, really. But um, we've got to get the first threshold to say, well, let's make it bigger before we make it better. OK, thank you. Um, I think we move on now to item nine on the agenda, um, the community forum review. Chris, would you like to lead us on that, please? Will do. Yep. Uh, let's get the slides up. Okay. Uh, so, um, as as Peter and some of the other councillors no doubt remember, the community forums have been around for a while in their sort of current incarnation, and with the uh, impact of the pandemic and going online, it seems like an opportune moment to have a look at how the forums are working, uh, what works, what doesn't work, what we could do better, and learn from what's going on elsewhere to see if there are lessons we can take from that and, and to improve what we're doing. Um, so it's it's a decade since we last made any big changes. We used to have a full-time officer looking after the forums uh, and that post was made redundant in 2012. Um, Obviously, over the last couple of years, we've all got used to new, using the new technology. Um, that was a very steep learning curve for, for all of us, but especially me trying to pilot these meetings from this end. Uh, and then when we did the Your, Management, Your Merton engagement exercise last year, um, we got some really good feedback on and, and a very clear desire for people to be involved in some of those decisions around things like the high street and green spaces and those local priorities, very much the sort of things that Tony's just been talking about. Um, so how do we facilitate that uh, in a better way than we might have done to date? 
So what we want to know is, is what you think works well currently and what could be improved. Uh, I've gone through all of the options that other London boroughs do, set out some examples of some of those. Uh, so you want some feedback on, on uh, what might work, what don't, what doesn't. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful just to run through some of those different models here, uh, invite some comments on that, as well as some feedback on, on the existing forums. Uh, so quite a few boroughs uh, run these area committees. These are formal committees uh, in the same way that scrutiny is, um, usually chaired and or always chaired by and uh, featuring a lot of councillors, but often with co-opted uh, groups or as associations to take part. There's usually an opportunity for public to speak at those meetings. Uh, often there's a budget attached to them. Uh, this is something they do over the border in Sutton. Uh, there are some councils, for example, Lambeth, who commission external agencies to run forums on their behalf. That gives them an independent voice. Uh, that can involve existing residence groups. So, for example, the council could support the Rose Park Association to run the forum in its entirety rather than uh, the current arrangement. So those are things that you, you could do. Uh, in some cases, these are online discussion groups as well as public meetings as well. Uh, with the growth of technology, we've seen more of these kind of digital panels or digital boards. So a, a panel is where you have a representative group of residents um, and uh, they will ask, be asked to take on regular online surveys about a variety of issues. And that's used as kind of a, 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 an intelligence gathering tool for the council, uh, but it's not open. It does, you can't have people just signing up. Usually it's normally by invitation. Uh, to a random sample. Uh, this is something Kensington and Chelsea do. Or discussion boards. Um, these are set up either on a ward basis or a ge geographical basis where people can discuss issues in their local area. To some extent, people already do that on things like Nextdoor, uh, but you can have uh, council run things as well. Uh, question time events are quite popular. So these are public meetings anyone can attend. And you'll have uh, elected councillors and officers, usually the leader or cabinet or uh, directly elected mayor in those cases. Uh, they can either be locally focused um, or have, across the whole borough. Uh, so the mayor of London does these along with all the assembly members. They go around London, uh, different location each time uh, and have these big question sessions, usually chaired by someone from LBC or, or another local journalist. Uh, on the other end of the scale, uh, Wandsworth do these on a ward basis, so they will go around it, the ward, so over a four-year period they'll get around all of their wards, uh, and people will be invited to come along and ask questions. Uh, citizens' assemblies have become quite popular in recent years. Uh, this is where you get a select, uh, randomly selected group of residents in, and you put a set of issues to them, and then they will come up with a set of recommendations on a particular issue. They, these have been very popular around the climate change agenda, uh, both nationally and, and locally. Uh, Newham have been doing some on their regeneration program. So you can see, for example, with something like the modern regen program, that uh, this kind of method might work quite well. Uh, this might cause palpitations amongst some of the people on the call, but uh, some boroughs have kind of handed over uh, this type of face-to-face -face engagement to their local ward councillors. Um, so they're supported by the council, but each ward might do something different. Um, they may host local meetings or again run something online, but it's very much in the hands of the councillors to do that. Uh, and then there's a mechanism for them to feed that into the organisation. That's a model that's been set up in Ely. Uh, so we've got a survey up and running on the consultations page. Um, that's open till the 4th of April. So please uh, submit your responses. It'd be really helpful to get feedback. Uh, and there's a section on what it's been like during COVID. There's a section on um, the forums more generally and a section on the other options that we might want to look at. Uh, uh, and that's really great, but happy to take any feedback now as well. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Chris Lartman, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, you wouldn't be surprised that I want to say something on this. I suppose, first of all, Chris, it's um, not easy or helpful, I think, to enter into 20 to 9, a discussion on something that's very big. 
I'll just make a couple of points. One is that the problem is if you're doing this across the borough, you'll probably find that some areas respond differently than others. My gut feeling is that we've got things fairly going well in Rains Park, that we have a good turnout for our forums and, um, and, and we've, we run it between the Rains Park Association and the local councillors and that's worked very well. And the other factor I'd mention is that it's probably not a good time in Rains Park to have this review because with the new ward boundaries, we're going to have a totally different feel to the way we operate as from next May. Uh, and, and, and so that the time really to look at it, I think will be after May rather than now. I mean, I think it's a very good question you've asked, but that um, the answer's going to vary, as I say, place by place. And, and we do need to have that discussion to see if there are better ways to reflect local reaction to, to local issues. Thank you, Chris. Tony, would you like to say something? Um, just to endorse what Chris has said, but um, I mean, one thing that we did have as well were business breakfasts, which were separate to the forum um, in order for people to actually get together and hear things, what was happening as well. I think we acknowledge that we need to try to get more business voices into the Rhines Park Association because there is a sort of deficit and we know that it's a political one in that individuals cast votes and appoint councillors businesses don't so they don't read there is a sort of democratic deficit on things that are happening which affect the high street and the commercial aspects of Rhines Park there isn't a voice that can be expressed on those concerns. I mean, we didn't we didn't put parking on the agenda tonight because we wanted to get away before midnight. But we could obviously, if you threw that into the mix, um, that would obviously be something to see how far um, parking is restricted to residents in places. And maybe there's a more imaginative way of protecting spaces from long term parking incursions but also making it a bit easier to park for businesses. So there's all sorts of dialogue that can take place. So I think Chris is right. It's been working quite well. The shared uh, responsibility between the council and the RPA has been very positive. And I think it's a very open forum as well. We're not excluding anybody. Um, there's only obviously minor administrative issues to make sure people put things on the agenda because you, you can't really respond to something if it hits you out of the blue. So I think it's um, just something we can carry on working on and just maybe say business interests may be something we should try to integrate a little bit more because they were running in parallel really. There was the forum and then were business breakfast and the two never connected really. Thank you Tony. Uh, Michael then Claire. Uh, it, th thanks a lot, Stephen. And um, yeah, I, I, I didn't mention uh, parking earlier on because I, I didn't want to have to uh, prolong the uh, conversation about uh, especially the high streets. Um, but in relation to the uh, forum, I, I think that um, the um, having it on Zoom during the pandemic has been uh, has actually been been great. Uh, my only thing would be that um, I think this is actually the first meeting where you haven't needed the passcode in order to access the meeting, um, which, which I fear may have um, prevented uh, previous uh, people uh, accessing the meeting. Um, and also, I, uh, I, my impression is that um, perhaps the forum could be um, advertised a, a, a bit more prominently um I, I i don't i don't know which uh method might might be a good way of doing that but perhaps if if zoom is continuing i i don't know how much um spend the council has on on sort of public advertising but um in the in in these days of social media uh looking at things like next door and uh, even Facebook, um, you, you know, where, where people are able to uh, then, you know, click on the link to, um, to the community forum. I, I, I know that you are doing it on YouTube as well, but um, I think all of these ways are, are, are great for 
people accessing the uh, the, the the forum and um, and obviously they can do so if they're not actually um, if they're away as well. So um, so even I, I I all I would say is that even if we do go back to having the forums in the library, it would still be great to somehow still have them on Zoom as well, if possible. Okay. That sounds like a kind of hybrid meeting like we do with some council meetings currently in the Civic Centre in the council chamber, but also available on Zoom and being shown on, on YouTube. Um, Claire, did you wish to say something? Uh, yeah, I suppose... I, I, yeah things have to change things have to move with the times things have to develop and work to meet the, the the widest possible need i suppose my question is what is the time scale chris for this discussion because there's an awful lot in this and it can't be done really quickly without talking to a lot a lot of people uh, yeah, I'm happy to respond to that. Yeah, it, you, definitely you're right. Um, so this is just an initial step to get some feedback and to see what desire there is for change and what kind of change that might look like. Now, there's elections in May, so we won't be doing anything until after a new administration has formed and they have an idea about what it is they want to do. And we also need to put the forums in the context of all the other things that we do um and what place that has uh what other role can we give to other things um when one of the big changes with zoom uh is if you've got a particular issue be it climate change or whatever it is and you want to hold a meeting meeting on that subject you don't need to wait for a forum now to bring that along you can set up something on zoom next week so it, it makes it the whole thing a bit more dynamic and that changes the role of the forum slightly so th there's all those sorts of things to bring into practice so I, I can't imagine we're going to be bringing it forward to uh, the decision making structure in the councils until the summer at the earliest um it would need to go through our internal structures first uh, overview and scrutiny as well um before it gets anywhere near sort of cabinet for it, uh, any kind of decision um so i think there'll be a whole, a whole range of things and obviously we will I'll have new chairs probably after May in most of the forum areas because quite a few of the current ones aren't standing again. So um, there'll be a, a new group of councillors to sort of bring on board and discuss this with as well. But I think it's also important that, that, that you're bringing the community leaders along as well as the councillors. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's fine change happening within the council but it's, it's how you bring people in their communities with you. So it can't be a top-down thing. It's got to be something that is, is engaging people right across the board. Yeah, I, I mean, we'll never come up with a model that fits everybody because the, they yeah. don't exist. So it, it's about having a range of tools uh, that do different jobs for different audiences in a different way but what we want to get to a place is 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 if someone wants to engage with the organization because they've got an issue or a concern that they can do it in a way that suits them at a time that suits them um and so we need to be able to create a range of tools and the forums will be part of that so mm -hmm. yeah it, it, it the forums are, are relevant to some audiences more than others uh, you can see from you know the, the attendance we usually get at the library uh, uh, it's not a very mixed crowd, it's not a very young crowd, but there are different mechanisms for younger people to get engaged. Yeah. So, yeah. so we we need to plan accordingly. Mm. It does sound as if the principle of forums in, in your slides, because no one was saying scrap forums altogether, their value seems to have been established. Well, I, I'm not prejudging anything um, at all. Uh, we have in our constitution that we will have some kind of area-based activity. It's quite unspecified as to what it actually looks like. So that gives us a degree of flexibility. So I think we will always end up with something, mm. but what exactly it is or how it works in practice, um, uh, we've got a lot of room for manoeuvre on. Mm. And it doesn't have to be one size fits all. Um, it can, uh, you know, the forums already 
do slightly different things in slightly different areas. So we can increase that flexibility. Uh, and if we're working with successful organizations like the RPA or Colleyswood Resident Association or Merton Park, they're already doing a much more effective job in engaging people than we are. So why would we duplicate the work that's being done? So perhaps we need to transform how we work with those kinds of organizations. And, and uh, But there are, there are pockets of the borough which aren't covered by successful residents associations. So how do we then manage those areas? So there's a lot of moving parts to, to work through. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris Lartman, I see your hand is up. Would you like to say something further? No, sorry, it should have come down. Thanks. That's okay. Um, so, Chris Withington, you seem to have had some comment and feedback from people in the meeting this evening. I assume you'd like me to urge them to, as it were, formally submit their comments via the, the website, Merton Council website. Um, and yes, please. Um, I think, you know, I would encourage everybody on the call this evening to give some thought to how they would like their forums to develop in the future. Uh, whether that is they are content with the current sort of setup or setup we used to have in the Rains Park Library or they want something else. As, as I say, I think it's important to try and spread the word and get as many views through the consultation as we possibly can. If it's extra motivation, currently we've had more responses from Wimbledon than Rains Park. So if, if you're at all competitive, I think now is the time to, we to are get your responses in. We are competitive, so I should urge all range park parkers to do their duty. And remember, we got waitos before Wimbledon. <laughs> um, it's uh, now, um, oh, well, eight minutes to nine. The meeting scheduled to close at nine. Unfortunately, Stephen Hammond seems to be delayed in Parliament voting. I haven't heard anything from him or Sally. Um, so it looks rather like he isn't going to be able to attend the meeting this evening. So I just uh, invite anybody to raise any other points, any other business. Has anyone any uh, issues they would like raised in these last few minutes? Um, can I ask just, Chris was going to clarify about the tree, on a tree strategy, um, about the date. Chris, were you going to address yeah. that? Yeah. So, um, the tree strategy consultation closed in uh, uh, February, um, and I think they had something like 500 responses. So that's a really good a number of responses to work through. So they're currently going through the process of looking at all those responses and putting together a draft. Uh, my understanding is they expect to have that draft, uh, that first draft, around um, April, May, and then that'll go back out for further consultation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think it only remains uh, for me to thank those who have presented this evening and to thank everybody who has joined in this evening, whether they asked questions, made comments or observed and saw the proceedings, which I think have been rather good tonight. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I wish you all a good evening. Oh, Jay, do you wish to say something? Yes, I just wanted to thank you too for your, the, the work and effort You've, you've put in over the years into our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. That, that's very kind. I have greatly enjoyed my eight years representing the residents of Rains Park. Um, it's been a great pleasure and an honour. So, um, yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I think now it just remains for me to say good evening and declare the meeting closed. Thank you.